This is a happy Monday to be had. Almost, uh, is this like the midpoint of the semester? Almost. Midterms coming up. Uh, man, I tell you, this, uh, if any of you have this uh, respiratory bug that's going around, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? It's a hard one to shake. I thought I had it kicked out. And I'm still on Mucinex and 24-hour cold relief. So if I act a little loopy today, I'm giving a disclaimer up front like I did to my Sunday school class yesterday. Uh, God's good, though. He's, he's giving me some, even though I'm on cold meds, it seems like, oh, my brain still can work and all of that. Well, we'll pray for those. I'm sure a few are out because of illness. They've emailed me and let me know. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, things happen to uh, students. I don't know if any of you uh, hang out with many college students. Um, one of the students that I had a long time ago, his name's Brady Romans. Have you heard about his situation? One of our college students, he, over the weekend, I think he um, lost his wife to a tragic car accident and the funerals today. So I want to pray for uh, Brady. Um, he's going to be graduating in May, too. So uh, he's one of our upcoming graduates. But that's that's happened in his life. And uh, so the Romans family we can pray for. Um, our friend, our colleague Jenny, um, she's had this uh, issue with her head. She had a head trauma, and she's been struggling with uh, ongoing um, kind of concussion symptoms, dizziness and things. So she emailed me, and she said she's still kind of not 100%. So her name's Jenny. I think she sits right over here sometimes. And uh, we can pray for uh, unspoken family tragedy, um, or not a tragedy. I, that's the wrong word for uh, our colleague Trevor. He uh, has to stay home because of... Uh, family emergencies. We'll pray for the Trevor and his family as well. So let's turn to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get started. Lord, we just uh, come to you as uh, dependent. Lord, we we trust you for so many things, and Lord, um, you are the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings, and Lord, you handle the details behind the scenes in so many ways. Lord, life is a mystery. Lord, as we look at your word, we'll see that some of these books will raise questions about life. And as we, in the upcoming weeks, books like Job that deal with uh, why righteous suffer, Lord, or Ecclesiastes, the book that questions life and its moral moral meaning and some of these things, Lord. But we, we live our lives and we trust in you, and that's what all of these books conclude with, is one who fears the Lord and, and, and walks after you in obedience, and uh, Lord, we need a childlike faith and trust sometimes, because we are not allowed to know all the whys. Lord, we're, our hearts uh, reach out to the uh, Romans family, Brady, and uh, over the loss of his wife. I'm, I think there's kids involved as well, and we um, pray for this gathering today, Lord, as they grieve her loss, and in, in, um, in uh, in the funeral that, that takes place, Lord, we pray for the pastor who will be overseeing this event. And, Lord, that maybe some hearts that come would be drawn to you through this event. Lord, pray for courage for Brady uh, as he grieves. And I uh, can't imagine uh, what he would be going through at this time, Lord. But would meet with him today in a special way. And we just trust you that you would be, even amidst this tragedy, there's some glory that would be had to your name today. Lord, we pray for our uh, sister uh, Jenny and her struggle, ongoing struggle with this head trauma and the dis dizziness that continues and persists. Lord, we pray for special healing for her as she seeks rest for most of her, her days. Lord, as she, um, it's hard for her to be sitting and, and upright. Just pray that you'd surround her with your peace and allow her to stay at um, Stay caught up in this class and other classes, Lord. Just grant her grace. Multiply her time and her energy as well, Lord. For Trevor and his situation, um, his family situation, emergency, just pray for whatever the details, that you'd be with him and his family. If there's illness involved, that you'd 
bring about uh, quick recovery or any emergency room visits or whatever is going on there. We pray, pray that you'd be the overseer of this situation. Lord, for others in this room, Lord, we pray for ongoing provision for finances, for um, extra strength for those mid-semester papers and book reviews. Lord, all of these things that come our way. And uh, pray for health and strength for students who might not be here today because of uh, health reasons. And uh, we just trust you for these things as well, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we are breaking into new ground today. Uh, we're starting Psalms. Can you believe it? I'm sure a favorite collection of uh, books uh, for a lot of you, the Psalms and Proverbs as we get into. Maybe not today. Maybe a little bit today. And then we'll uh, catch up a little bit with... Uh, where we are in the class schedule. I'll have some more to say on the midterm later this week, but uh, next week we don't have uh, we don't have a reading quiz scheduled. It's just the midterm exam, so um, that's what we'll have, and probably be catching up a little bit in in our class discussion. But nothing that we have uh, next week in class will be on the midterm. So where we end today is really where we'll break for content for the midterm and our, our fund for the midterm exam. So any questions on, on where we are in the class schedule and uh, where we are today? Where are we today? Have you ever woken up and asked that question? Who am I? Why am I here? I wanted to share, start with something a little different before we break into Psalms. It's interesting, and I, I, I don't know if I've ever made this connection, uh, I was preparing for my Sunday school lesson, and it just dawned on me how we, uh, in, my, in the first semester class that a lot of you had with me last fall, we talked about the book of Judges and the thesis statement of the book of Judges. Do you remember we talked about, you know, he puts it at the end of his book. There was no king in Israel. Everybody was doing what was right in his own eyes. And then we talked about the book of Ruth. That's how we ended this semester. So the book of Ruth. So that's what I was teaching yesterday in my Sunday school class. And it's interesting how the book of Ruth ends, and I think I made a little bit of a, a point with how the book of Ruth ends in focusing on that leftover thesis statement from the author of Judges. Remember the evaluation that he gives for that 400-year period is... You know, remember spiritual chaos, and it's just kind of a one illustration after another of, yeah, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. Oh, here's another example of that. Oh, wow, here's another example of that. And that's kind of the feeling that you get when you read that book, the book of Judges. But the book of Ruth comes at you like a breath of fresh air. And um, if you want to turn to uh, to Ruth, I was just looking at the... We'll just turn there together. Those last couple chapters pack a pretty powerful punch because, uh, and some of this will overlap into what I'm talking about today. That's why I kind of picked it as a introduction discussion. And you remember that in the book of Ruth, there, it's all about the faithful remnant in this little town of Bethlehem. Naomi, you've got Boaz stepping in. Uh, he acts as the kinsman redeemer. And then there's the question of the Leverite marriage. And he's providing for the household of Elimelech. Remember the deceased husband of Naomi. The whole reason why she needs to be provided for. She loses her husband, the head of household. So there's this household crisis in Bethlehem. So what do the faithful do to... Uh, protect and provide for one another. So that's that's the whole backdrop of the book of, of Ruth. You've got Boaz stepping in, you've got Naomi, and then there's the uh, controversial, but we, we, we argued against the controversial encounter at the threshing floor. Ba basically, Ruth offers herself as uh, the question she asked Boaz is, what about the Le Leverite marriage? Is this something that we can enact? So there's some legal matters the next day. And uh, that's what Boaz does. He goes to the city gates, and he takes care of the legal matter. 
uh, with the uh, city uh, officials and elders at the city gates, and the matter is settled. He's second in line, but the first guy says, no, it's going to mess me up too much. You take it. This is something you can do. You're... So he steps in. and It's all about loyalty. It's what Boaz does to provide for the, the name and the reputation of the household of Elimelech. Now, what I really was interested in is, is the fact of Elimelech Uh, I'm going to spell it like Hebrew. I think it's C-H, something like that. But that's the, anyway, <laughs> the Hebrew letter. So the name Elimelech, this, I didn't know that, uh, I wasn't thinking of making this connection, but it's an interesting one. The name Elimelech, maybe you know, means my God is king. So by providing for the name and reputation of Elimelech, you've got Boaz, you've got everybody around who's, who's concerned. It, you know, we talked about this. We talked about this especially this semester when we, we went through our discussion on, on David. Because where does Samuel go, right, to find King David? Where does he go? This is going to be on your midterm. If you can keep. What? He goes to Bethlehem, doesn't he? Yeah. He goes to, uh, and who's David's dad's name? What's his name? Jesse the Bethlehemite. So there, this is a family from Bethlehem. It's, it's all taken place in this small little country, small town. Remember our discussion of, you know, David's preparation for king. Well, yeah, he was good with the sling. He took down the Philistine giant. But more importantly, somebody had prepared him spiritually for the job. Remember? He had his theology correct when he was on the battlefield. Where'd that come from? Bethlehem, growing up in a small town with a praying grandma and uh, sitting around going to church and singing. Here's my, here's my transition for today. Singing hymns, singing songs about theology. Some, he, he's getting his theology from somewhere. They didn't have a lot of books back then. They, weren't, they were singing theology. They were singing their Bible lessons. And that's where the book of Psalms comes in because um, while we don't know for sure before King David came along, but after King David for sure, we start the collection. The early Psalms, the first corpus here, is largely attributed to the hand of King David who comes from Bethlehem. So I'm wondering, you know, how much of his head start did he get being the worshiping king, leading his kingdom in worship by writing Psalms that speak correct theology, the kind of theology that you need on the battlefield when you're taking on the Philistine giant. It's just a hunch of mine. Is it interesting to you? Does that make sense? So I was making, so the name and reputation of, of Elimelech, the household of Elimelech, it's just one more clue, one more signal that my God is king. It, they were probably very concerned about some of these things in Bethlehem. They had a, a sense of destiny, perhaps. They, um, we, we looked at the prophet Micah. Um, do you remember some, somewhere we, we talked about, maybe we haven't talked about this, but Micah chapter 5, Micah the prophet is from a town very nearby Bethlehem, just a few miles down the road. And in Micah chapter 5, that's the prophecy where Micah says, and from Bethlehem will emerge and be born the king of kings. You know, there's just a lot going on in Bethlehem. Uh, of course, we all, all know the uh, ultimate, the pinnacle event is, you know, the birth of the king of kings, who, uh, who the young couple from Bethlehem. So it's just interesting. So I'm going to make the case that uh, when we start and we talk about wisdom, Psalms, and then the other wisdom books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and the book of Job, there's a corpus of books here that are coming out of this. And the reason I start here in this place in the semester talking about this collection of books, it threw a few people off with regards to the, to the quizzes. You're expecting a quiz on Chronicles, you know. But no. It's on Psalms, and uh, 
the reason is, is the Psalms fit right into the early monarchy in terms of their production through the inspired authors, David and others. And these Psalms are coming in at a point where the theology of the singing church, you know, the, 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 the faithful remnant are, are active. It shows us that there was a group of people in Israel who were not weighed down with legalism. They weren't unhappy about the, the law. No, they were singing about it. They were, it, was a, it, was a, it was an opportunity for, for them to demonstrate faithfulness and obedience. Yes. Psalm 19 is the longest psalm. It's all about the Torah, you know, and as a celebration, an opportunity, and uh, uh, it's, it's evidence of God's grace and all of these things. So, and then the other books like, uh, that we'll, we'll all, I'm going to attribute uh, largely to Solomon, um, Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs, like Psalms for David, are the books that he is representative of that uh, illustrate he, like David, at the end of his life, looking back, a little more honest, a little more edgy, but because of some recognized failure on his part, I think, in some areas, he looks back and he leaves some pretty significant books for his kingdom. Uh, as a means of conveying theology and real practical matters of, you know, how do you apply Moses' teaching to the everyday details of life? So we're going to get into that when we get into Proverbs, um, of course, and Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. All right? So that's where we are. Psalms represents uh, David and we, I, the idea of Torah worship, the worship of, of Torah and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Psalms would be for Solomon, Torah applied. That's, that's kind of an interesting, I think I throw that out as a way of kind of thinking about it as we move ahead. So, all right. Well, let's talk about Psalms. When you turn the page to Psalms and you leave a book like you know, that we've just got done, let's say, Second Kings, you know, it's set up differently in your Bible for a, for a reason. As you probably know, we're dealing with now Hebrew poetry and Psalms and Proverbs and all of these books are written in this poetic, uh, ancient poetic style. I will talk a little bit about that uh, before we get into some of the text. But um, back in the day, one of the big ideas behind why Hebrew poetry? It's interesting that the, the prophets also use this form of written communication, um, which really leads us to understand that it was probably also coming from spoken communication, written down first, and then um, communicated in, I would argue, live context, especially the prophets. They're preaching through this mode of communication, and it's an effective way of communication. It's a, mem it's a way of um, communicating something that can be, in that culture, much more dependent on the ear rather than the eye. That's their way of communicating something that's memorable. You walk away and you've got a few, few of the bullet points stuck in your head. It's kind of like the modern phenomena of the spoken word, I think. It's an interesting connection. If any of you are into rap, right? I can see all of you out there. A lot of you, especially you, Kate, you understand? You're into the rap scene? I'm just kidding. No. Um, and I'm not going to pick on you, sorry. <laughs> but rap. Um, that's a, is that unique uh, culturally to uh, this country? How widespread is it? Is it kind of taken off all over the place? Okay. Yeah, isn't that interesting? It's all over the place. And why is that the case? If you hear a good rap song, does it kind of stick around in your head a little bit? You know what I'm talking about? It's that logical connection of ideas. It's that kind of that beat that you have, and it's boom, ba doom, doom, doom. You know, it's that. Oh yeah, I read this. I remember a song. I don't know why, but it's in my head. You know, it's that kind of thing. So this is a long-standing way of communication. It's not new. It's just kind of polished up a bit, and that's what the guys are doing now. I mean, we do it, and we have a little bit of some examples in. Let's just take the, uh, the, the uh, song quiz. 
You can fill in the blanks, right? Yeah. All of these probably. I mean, hopefully you'll get 100% on all of these. If you don't, I'm going to throw them on the midterm next week. So. <laughs> What's the first one? All hail the power of Jesus' name. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Yes. When I survey the wondrous cross. Yeah, that's a little hard. Who got that when you get the A+. Plus. You know, when I was, uh, uh, I was in some context, I think, maybe I heard this, it was a comedian or something. They make fun of the uh, wondrous cross because uh, a kid probably was thinking that it was talking about a one dress cross. It's like, what? One dress cross? Anyway, so, okay. But yeah, we, why, is this so, why is this so effective? When we worship and when we sing and we sit down corporately or even uh, individually, this is the logical connection of, of the phrases, two-part phrases kind of com combining together, right? Um, all hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. So there's logical connections between these two phrases and put to music, which is what King David did because of his, his experience and training growing up in Bethlehem. Uh, this worked well for him as a theological, uh, not a, a musical, a, a theologian and musician combo as, 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 as a part of his role as king. So it seems to be also lines up well with how our brain works, which is interesting. We talk, you know, about the, you know, I went to the faith and uh, science conference, bits of it last week, and one of the presentations, the guy talked about the uniqueness of the image of God and some of the things that I like to bring out in, in our class from fall. We talked about that. And one of the uniquenesses of the fact that we have the image of God is, I think, directly related to our ability to worship. And interestingly, in this kind of way. Um, and it's universal. So whatever language you have, songwriters can use this tool because it lines up well with the way human beings, image of God bearers, are intended to, to think and process. Does that make sense? We can reflect on... God's good creation and who he is and we can grasp abstract thought different than any other living thing on the planet. That's our unique role. So you worship leaders out there, be encouraged. You know, you're doing something that is hardwired into who we are, who we're created to be and what we're created to do. Uh, my cats, I about killed them last night. They like to get up really early and start worshiping. And uh, <laughs> the bad habit that they've gotten into, and I don't know how to handle this, I was just fit to be tied, I almost like had a real car carnal moment. <laughs> I did have a carnal moment. <laughs> Whereas nothing you can do because they're scratching at the door and I close the door. I don't want them to come in because I need a good night's sleep. It's 8 o'clock is awfully early on a Monday. And those precious little things like to come in and snuggle at 4 o'clock in the morning. So they demand to be let in, and they knock on the door. It's like, all right, it's all right to come in. We live here too, and you need to let us in at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I don't know where that was going. They're not worshiping. They're just being a nuisance, but anyway. Well, here's an actual psalm. So you see the connections here, and it's not a... Hard jump to go from there to here, you know. And now we have uh, a real example of uh, Psalms, uh, as we're going to read. Here's a portion of Psalm 51. So you've got, in uh, you know, the experts in this. You'll get into this in maybe an ex higher level class. If you take an elective on on Psalms or something like that, you'll get into more of this kind of thing. But the relationship of each line, um, we'll talk about what this. The phenomena is called parallelism, parallel Hebrew parallelism. So you've got the A column, the middle column, and the, uh, the B, B column, and then the A column. So this is like a A, B, B, A pattern. ABBA, I call it the ABBA pattern. One of the 
greatest rock and roll groups of all time. <laughs> it's memorable. You can remember it that way, ABBA. You know, it has to do with singing, so it's easy to remember it. So you've got the A line, be gracious to me, God. B, capital B, according to your faithful love. And then you've got the middle B, according to your abundant compassion. And then you've got the little A line, blot out my rebellion, and then a parallel continuation, wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. So as you think, and maybe you, you uh, when you start reading Psalms this way, it really is interesting. You see it all over the place, and even into the uh, prophetic text. So what we do is you compare each of the boxes in terms of their logical relationship. And that's how the authors did it. So what is it about the B line that is, how is it logically related to the first part? And how's the middle two B boxes compared to each other? So you see the BBs are, I mean, you can see it right away. The first one is a, is a request, be gracious to me, God. So it's, ask, it's a, a request asking God to do something. But then on the basis of the two, kind of the middle of the Big Mac sandwich, you've got according to your faithful love and according to your abundant compassion. Two aspects or qualities about who God is. So on the basis of those two things, the request comes. And then, oh, by the way, you've got some follow-up lines that relate to the first. So the little a relates to the lowercase a relates to the uppercase a. Three more requests based on the character and nature of God represented in the two middle lines, stanzas. Blot out my rebellion, wash away my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. So... Of course, it's all King David. It's about how he's uh, unpacking the theology of how to deal with sin in the context of Psalm 51. He's doing this in Hebrew parallels, poetry, parallelism, and he's doing it in an effective manner because very quickly his congregation, his kingdom, would learn this song and memorize it, and they'd have it down, and they'd be able to sing it and repeat it throughout the ins and outs of a daily work-a-day world. They'd be able to teach their children and some of these things that were important to a faithful community. And, you know, it's not all about the rhyme in Hebrew poetry. Sometimes you see rhyme for emphasis, but the big idea is about the logical relationship between the two lines. Line A, line B, and then line B and line A, and and, and you break it apart. You break the Psalms apart like this, you can start to see those relationships. So it's not about the rhyme. If I was to do this, da 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 and you'd go, da 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 You know, it's a, we've got these patterns in, in our kind of rhyming schemes and growing up with nursery rhymes and everything's about how, what the last word of the line is. It's not quite like that in, in Hebrew poetry. Um, so, um, let's talk about parallelism, and I'll introduce you to three basic types, and this is, this will probably get you into 90% plus of all of the kinds of logical relationships that you see in the Hebrew poetry, and the most common synonymous two or three lines where similar thought is repeated. So you just got the first idea, and then the second idea, it's just kind of a, uh, a repetition of the first idea. So therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Psalm 1.5. So now we get into some more interesting categories of, and these are not new to any of you, antithetic, two or three lines where the second or the third idea makes a contrast with the first idea. So that's antithetical or antithetic parallelism. So the example here in Psalm, the next verse in Psalm 1, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, and you see the word but. A lot of the big buts of the Bible are in here. But the way of the wicked will perish. So you see there's the contrast. Um, and then finally, we have synthetic, two or three lines, advance or further explain the idea of the first. So idea, and then with the synthetic 
parallelism, it's the author's way of expanding on the idea of the first. So as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord, that's the new idea, has compassion on those who fear him. So the idea of the Lord is, is new, and the idea of compassion is the same. There's the parallelism, but the expansion is bringing in Lord who's like a father, and then the idea of, of what the... <coughs> Who's the one who's a child in that child-father relationship? But Well, between the Lord, it's those who fear him. You see what you do there? See, you, you, you see the, the commonality of the two, uh, the two lines. But then in this one, this is kind of exciting because that then you have the theological expansion going on from the first line. And that gets kind of fun. Then you can get into some good uh, sermon preparation. If you think, think through... Psalms like that, or in your Sunday school teaching. So, and this is all over the place. This is how Psalms works, and the the short uh, phrases or the short uh, pithy sayings that we'll see in Proverbs, as well as the prophetic, um, written down sermons of the prophets Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. They're all writing this way. They're, they're preaching messages as they're, you know, your Jeremiah on the on the streets of Jerusalem as uh, the Babylonians are threatening to knock down the walls on the outside. You've got the prophet who's got the megaphone on Main Street, you know, where all the traffic comes through, and he's preaching in this kind of way. He's, he's, he's doing this kind of communication. Quick question. Yeah, sure. Um, how do you determine the line breaks? Uh, there's a thought here. I have one line where... Um, Dr. Smith has two in Psalm 51 or something like that. I'm sorry? The question is, how do you determine line breaks? Very carefully. <laughs> well, that's part of, the, part of the strategy of interpreting Psalms. I mean, if you, um, largely in the English, they, they, they give us a lot of uh, help. If you look in, um, like Psalm 1, they oftentimes do it with... Uh, How blessed is the man, break, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, break, nor stand in the path of sinners, break, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, break. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, break, and his law he meditates day and night, break. So a lot of it's done with the lines and the punctuation a little bit. Um, but in the original, um, you know, in the Hebrew, there's also some ways of, of, of looking for clues, but it's probably outside of the purview of this class, but um, yeah, that's a good question. There's uh, So that's what we get into with uh, the Hebrew um, Psalms, the, the idea of parallelism. But now there's types of Psalms, the broader categories of Psalms that when you pick up your Bible and read a Psalm, um, you want to make sure you're aware of the kind of genre that you might be looking at uh, with regards to Psalms. So Broadly speaking, there's these five categories. Um, scholars may wrangle about, you know, breaking it down into smaller groupings, and you'll probably see that in various commentaries and uh, books on the Psalms. But basically, you've got the most common hymns of praise. You know, a, a good example is Psalm 8. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth, who has displayed thy splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars which you've ordained, who am I, right, that you've taken thought of me and the son of man that you care for him? So psalms that evoke praise uh, are probably, as you expect, the most common that we see. Also, uh, we'll look at this a little bit later, but what's called a category called the Royal Psalms. It's a special category basically focusing on, on the monarchy, the idea of the monarchy in Israel, but even more so, the monarchy that's to come. So there's Psalms that begin to uh, proclaim the theology of the Messiah already that early in history. 
you start to see this developing theology of the Messiah start to break forth in the singing church. So, uh, you know, did the theology of the Messiah begin first with the prophets? You know, the suffering servant passages of Isaiah? Uh, there seems to be this earlier kernel of, of this recognition that maybe got kind of launched from the Davidic covenant when David first heard from the prophet Nathan and started to ponder and reflect on the fact that there's this everlasting kingdom that God has promised to him, that uh, an everlasting eternal kingdom that somewhere the, the promised one, the he from Genesis 3.15 would come through his line and sit and reign and rule as king, someone from his eternal dynasty. Whoa, okay. Let's, let me theologically reflect on that. And as a divinely inspired author, you've got King David and others are going to start to have that experience and share that theology with the worshiping community. So we've got like Psalm 110 is an example of a royal psalm. Let's see. You've got the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. The Lord will stretch forth thy strong scepter from Zion. That's a pretty significant picture saying, rule in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people will volunteer freely in the day of thy power and holy array from the womb of the dawn. Thy youth are to thee as do. So focusing on the kings, the Lord's role as king, for example. And then you've got some more practical psalms. Um, Thanksgiving psalms are another um, category. Uh, I love thee, O Lord, my strength, Psalm 18. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Thank you, Lord, is the attitude there. And those are good. We oftentimes like to camp out in those psalms when we have our quiet times and personal times with the Lord. So those are reflections. Um, focus on the help from Yahweh, from the Lord in times of need. And then we have uh, the two categories of lament, uh, the, the I'm sorry kind of um, psalm, to be personally sorry over personal sin or conflict. Um, Things like that. Psalm 51, for example, King David's the one we, that we, we're all familiar with, is a personal individual psalm of lament. And then the, the community or corporate version of that would be the community lament. Um, corporate, um, a corporate version of an individual lament, like Psalm 44. Oh God, we, you know, there's the corporate idea. We have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us the work that you did in their days, in the days of old. Thou with thine own hand didst drive out the nations. Then thou didst plant them. Thou didst uh, afflict the peoples. Then thou didst spread them abroad. And that goes on. So it's a corporate we. Third First person plural uh, pronouns are used in those psalms, for example. Um, and uh, that psalm particularly, Psalm 44, would probably best represent the context of the exilic experience. So all the way up through and, and into the exilic experience, we have these psalms that are being written to kind of write down and communicate in capture the sense of how the community is feeling about things, how the community uh, needs to respond uh, to certain events that have happened. Um, kind of a kind of a group therapy session in song. How's that? Um, there's times when the community needs to express sorrow over sin or sinful attitudes, or express thanksgiving as a group, um, or praise before the Lord. And all of these things. What's really interesting about the Psalms is just the variety. You all know that. There's just such a variety of Psalms. You turn the page, and this Psalm's different than that Psalm. And um, Scholars uh, have a broad swath of things to say about 
well, how do we organize the psalms? Is there some kind of timeline? And it's a little bit tricky sometimes to fit psalms into a very rigid historical context with here's a defined audience in mind or in view. Here's the author. Sometimes we know. Sometimes the you know we've got those uh, subtitles that, that introduce us to a little bit of the context, but sometimes those are a little vague and only talk about the musicians and the instruments used and What's this psalm? Where is it at? What's, what's the raw nerve that it's addressing? So that takes a little bit of work, but just recognize it. Though every psalm does have a, a, has a context. It has an author, an audience in mind, and with a little bit of thinking, we can probably do a pretty good job of coming close. Um, with regards to those titles, um, over the history and the formation of uh, the collection of psalms, um, titles were assigned to, to the Psalms, as you know, and it's always in the first stanza, uh, typically set apart in, in smaller font in your study Bible, but it's, that's what we're talking about. It's those, those titles that were assigned. Every, all but 34 Psalms have those titles. So, um, and 116 titles, 100 of them seem to indicate and, or direct us to some kind of authorship identity and then the other 16 don't. So you can see there's just kind of a, not necessarily a consistent approach to how those titles came to be, but over the, when the concrete was not dry formation period of the Psalms, those titles were assigned at various times. And then they just were added, and then they became part of the, of the corpus. And then we moved the Psalms into the period where the concrete was dry. And, in, and we talked about that last semester, that period where, the text was preserved and then transmitted into for future use. So, Just a question? Sure. So where would the imprecatory psalms fit in terms of like types of psalms? Would they be in like the individual laments or would they fit in the community laments or? The imprecatory psalms I'll be talking about a little bit. Oh, okay. But in terms of these categories, um, Hmm. Probably the lament category, kind of a subcategory of a lament, but it might, you know, it might warrant. It's kind of a, it represents a collection of psalms. There's certain psalms that are all kind of in that kind of um, imprecatory genre that we'll see. Um, but I think it's kind of a subcategory in the, in the individual and community lament. Um, in terms of the identified authors, um, what we have is. Psalm 90 is attributed to Moses. Now, I don't think that we have to be, you know, the debate is the, these titles, I don't know if we can put in the category of necessarily divinely inspired. I, uh, it's kind of a, it's, 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 you know, I don't know. I mean, we get into scholarly discussion about how far do we go with, with, with knowing, is this really a psalm of Moses, or is that necessary, or is it attributed to Moses, or is the, is the title given to kind of uh, commemorate Moses by the psalm, or you know, it gets a little confusing. But um, I think we're a little more sure with the Davidic psalms. Um, most of the first of the first seventy-three psalms will have David attributed uh, to to them. Uh, psalm seventy-two and one twenty-seven are attributed to Solomon himself, King Solomon. And then we have some other names that we don't know a lot about. Asaph is attributed, uh, 12 psalms are attributed to Asaph, probably a, a songwriter and, and song leader, perhaps, in the believing community. There's 10 psalms that are attributed to the sons of Korah. And then one, two obscure names, uh, Heman and Ethan, Psalm 88 and 89, are attributed to them. Probably like Asaph, these are individuals who were involved in the the worship uh, of the of the believing community at the time. So, all right. Now you ask, but here we go. Some of the psalms uh, we have the uh, collection of songs um, called the imprecatory psalms. These are Psalm 5, 10, 28, 35, 40, 55, 59, 69, 79, 109, and 137. They're all spread out throughout the whole corpus. 
Now, the controversy or the, the, the discussion about the imprecatory psalms is that um, you read them and it's like, what did I just read, you know? These are the psalms that seem to uh, invoke bad or calamity or divine vengeance, you might say, from one person who's, this, who's, who's using the psalm or singing the psalm against another. For example, let's turn to one uh, example in Psalm 79. So here we go. O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled thy holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the dead bodies of the servants for food to the birds of the heavens, the flesh of thy godly ones to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water around Jerusalem. And there was no one to bury them. We have become our reproach. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, the scoffing and derision to those around us. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the nations which do not know thee, and upon the kingdoms which do not call upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste, laid waste his habitation. Do not remember the iniquities of our forefathers against us. Let thy compassion come quickly to meet us, for we are brought very low. Now, the, you know, the tricky thing in teaching and preaching uh, and being honest to the fact that these mm -hmm. psalms are part of the inspired collection, right? Is what do we do with these vengeance psalms? And how do we reconcile that with, let's say, Matthew 5.44, right? Uh, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Is that, that's the challenge, right? Have you all been faced with this challenge ever? Um, maybe some skeptics in your church or those people in your Sunday school classes who like to ask the hard questions. Hey, what about this one? This, what, are we supposed to pray this way against our enemies? So what's the challenge here? How do we, uh, you know, let's talk about it. I'm, I'm prepared to talk about it. There's a time for all things. Not hide. What? There's a time for all things. Well, you know, one of the things that, about this particular psalm, Psalm 79, I think everyone needs to be kind of looked at uh, individually, recognizing it's got an audience in mind, the author. Um, in this particular sense, you get the idea that this might be a group or at a time period where you see the context coming out in, in the... Uh, this is a group of, who's experienced some pretty rough stuff, Right? They've experienced the, perhaps some war crimes. They've been dislodged from their homes. They've lost loved ones, perhaps, on the battlefield or in the, in the crossfires of war. And you see that coming out. They've got some... Um, they've got a... They've got a, 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 a what's my term here? They've got a live wire going on inside of their heart of hearts against some uh, nations around that maybe overdid it in terms of the, their battle practices and their, their exilic uh, practices. They're in a minority now. Maybe they're, they're, they're dealing with being oppressed. You know? So how is a psalmist, how is a worship leader who's, who's trying to um, move this group ahead uh, going to do that? You know, just like King David writing psalms to kind of launch the, the, the theological enterprise of the kingdom. Let's, let's sing proper songs about who God is. I'm going to write a few of those myself. Well, I'm going to help my, my kingdom deal with sin. Well, I've just failed myself. What a great time to do that. Psalm 51, Psalm 32. Um, but now you've got this audience that maybe is in exile, and they're, they're experiencing loss. They've, they've experienced loss. Let's write a song that helps them connect with that raw nerve and get it going and pointed in the right direction, right? Something like that. So you've got a lot of things um, to say about the imprecatory songs. You've got to practice saying the word imprecatory. But um, 
one of the things that's close to the heartbeat of these imprecatory songs is Unique's covenant relationship with the Lord. Um, and there's this seriousness about that covenant relationship. A fierce loyalty. You know, it's kind of like the, the jealousy, the words jealousy comes into a lot of these imprecatory songs. Um, and the idea of vengeance. So I'm, uh, you know, the idea that the Lord is entitled to some sense of bringing about his agenda in the situation, whether it be his wrath or his judgment. There's this invitation in these imprecatory songs by the worshiping community. So I think that's healthy. It puts the job of whatever the Lord wants to do in his time in his hands. I can be sitting in my house, looking at the wall, being angry all day, or I can be encouraged to say, you know, God's the one who's the ultimate judge. He's the one that will have the last word in this situation. He's a God of wrath. Thank, thank you for reminding me, psalmist. He's a God who's, who's jealous about what he cares about most. Kind of like my role with my wife. If somebody came knocking on the door and started pushing the door in, threatening my my loved ones, as a husband, I'd take the guy down, no questions asked. No guns even used, you know. I just use these guns, not just these. Um, Yo, oh, stop the camera. Did you think that was funny? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know martial taekwondo or anything. I just use my, my fist. But I'd get vengeance really quick. On this guy, I mean, does God feel that way about things sometimes? You know, we you know, we talk about a God of love, but He's also a God of wrath and a God of He's a jealous God. We go back to uh, you know places like uh, I'll just go back really quick Exodus 19, you know, and that very intimate language that the Lord uses at Mount Sinai. Remember the wet the wedding day we talked about last fall, and Psalm 19 verses one through five. You yourselves, the Lord is saying to his newly formed nation, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you'll be my segulah, my most prized possession among all the peoples, for the, all the earth is mine. But you know what, Israel? You're my most special and prized possession. So now they're in exile. What happened to that? Maybe they're waiting for the husband to come home to discover what just happened in the house, you know, and the damage that's been done. Maybe it's time for the Lord to act. And a psalm would be written like an imprecatory song to uh, maybe capture some of this. The, the raw nerve, right? The raw feelings that are involved. Um, <clears throat> with the segula and how a, a pagan nation has come in and overdid and overstayed their welcome, they, you know, coming in and exiling, taking into exile the precious nation of, of Israel. Um, and, and an imprecatory song might capture some sense of that. Um, also, the it brings in these imprecatory psalms also bring in some of the, uh, the blessing and the cursing language uh, that we already have from, from Moses. In, in the Torah. So places in Deuteronomy, if we go to, like, say, Deuteronomy 28, <coughs> we remind ourselves of what Moses taught, taught Israel. Deuteronomy 28, so let's see, 15 through 21. It shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe all of his commandments, his statutes in which I charge you today. These curses shall come upon you and overtake you perhaps. You'll be cursed in the city. You'll be cursed in the country, wherever you go. You'll be, your basket will be cursed and your kneading bowl. Uh, offspring of your body, produce of your ground, increase of your herd, young of your flock. You come in and when you go out, the Lord will send upon you curses, confusion, chaos, Futility and all of these things will undertake you until you're you're destroyed and you cease to exist as a nation. You can't deal with that paganism thing too long, right? Paganism activity in the promised land. So that's that's what the Lord says is prohibited behavior 
from my segulah, from my people. So, so some of these imprecatory psalms bring in some of this, I guess, the seriousness of the situation. Maybe we're in exile, and we really, 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 really feel it now. We get it, Lord, and we understand when we were in the promised land acting like pagans, you weren't very happy about it. Now, we've got this raw nerve over here, and this psalm, corporate lament maybe, we're singing it together to kind of remind ourselves how to feel about that because it's a, as close as we can get to how you feel about it, and now we're waiting for you to act, you know, something like that. So it really gets interesting with these psalms. Some of them are in your face, and poo, you know, um, you read them, and it's like, what did I just read? And this was being sung? Yes, it was, you know. So it helps us to understand that they're an honest group, the group that was singing these songs, um, working out their situation, whether they're in exile or whether they're in the still in the kingdom before it falls, but still book of judges all over again, chaos all around. The majority of everyone around is is going downhill in a handbasket, and we're the faithful worshiping church looking around saying, God, what are you up to? You know, Can we turn this thing around? We're still trying to be faithful here, but they're part of the faithful minority. But at the, the Psalms are always directed to the faithful minority. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Wherever they are and whatever's going on around them in history, there's this faithful group, and they're having church, and they're working it out, and theologically working it out as, as, as a result. And that's what we have in the Psalms. Um, and third, another thing about the imprecatory psalms is the, the name and the reputation of the Lord is at stake um, amongst his people and in, in view of the entire world, the watching world, the nations. So, so it's not about personal payback, payback. It's not about personal vengeance. I think that imprecatory psalms are allowing God to be God in the situation. It's kind of helping the group to get there and to recognize God is the one who is personally involved in any kind of judgment and in uh, any kind of uh, kind of wrathful response to the situation. And the kingship of God is always in the front and center of these imprecatory psalms. God as king, um, God's never off of his throne in these situations. And finally, um, the enemies that are referred to in the imprecatory psalms. Any of the enemies are ultimately enemies of God. They're the enemies that the Lord is ultimately going to be responsible for subduing. That's important in the imprecatory Psalms. So I don't know. There might be a, a doctoral dissertation waiting to be written on the, the therapeutic use of <laughs> the imprecatory Psalms in counseling situations. I don't know. I'd be interested to know how the biblical counselors uh, view the imprecatory psalms. You, anybody out here in biblical counseling, have you, have you tackled this or even talked about it much? A little bit? Yeah. Am I pretty accurate or pretty close? Good. It makes me feel better. I'm not off on a, on a limb here. All right, well, let's do this. Let's take our first break of the morning. We'll come back in 10 minutes. How's that? All right. <laughs>